Okay, hello and welcome everyone to our regular WFO webinar. My name is Ilya Karnauhov and I'm a Senior Development Manager at World Forum of Showwind, or simply WFO. Uh, today's webinar is on offshore wind market updates in the US, Germany and the Netherlands. It's my great pleasure to welcome our three excellent speakers for today. We have Timon Homberg, a Business Development Manager at Blix Consultancy. We have Felix Fischer, and Marika Ludeke from uh, Chatham Partners. And we have uh, John Begala, Vice President for State and Federal Policy at the Business Network for Offshore Wind. And before we jump into their presentations, let me tell you a few things about WFO. We are a nonprofit organization founded in 2018, and we focus on offshore wind energy only. We promote offshore wind energy globally and our members represent the complete offshore wind value chain. We have international offices in Hamburg, Tokyo, <coughs> Taipei, and New York. And in terms of our activities, it's very straightforward as we focus on three things only. We lobby for offshore wind around the world, we inform about offshore wind via a number of media channels, and we connect the global offshore wind community by organizing events such as this one. Um, and in terms of our members, we're very happy to already have over 100 members. And you can see this on this slide. And we're delighted to have companies from all over the world and uh, companies from North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. And if somehow you are still not a member of WFO, please feel free to reach us. Uh, and our uh, managing director, Gunnar Horsik, will be happy to answer any questions you might have. And just a few words about the structure of this webinar. It's very simple. In the first half of the, of the webinar, we're gonna have three speakers, uh, Felix, John, uh, Timon, uh, and actually uh, Felix and Marika. Uh, and they will present on the topic um, of today webinar. And then we have time left for the Q&A session. And you can um, use the chat function to uh, input your question there. And then I will read it to our speakers. So that's all from my side. Uh, without any further ado, uh, Felix and Marika, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. I hope you can see our presentation. I can't right now. All right, now we can. All right, sorry about this. Um, so, so we are uh, just a brief, couple of brief words on chat and we are a law boutique a uh, boutique law firm uh, based in Hamburg. We are simply young, six years old. We're a um, spin-off from other uh, bigger law firms that have a very big footprint here in the energy sector and particularly in the offshore wind sector and um, do a lot of work here in the project development and also in transactions in that field. Um, know a lot of the projects here in Germany and obviously we're very excited about the new regime that um, is happening in uh, or has come uh, uh, past the legislative process in Germany and which is going to come into force in uh, 2023, um, allowing for a significant um, uh, addition to uh, the German tendering, uh, especially in volume, um, and also enacted a new uh, process for the, for the tender rounds, which uh, not in all regards follow the suggestions by the industry, but still um, uh, there is going to be significantly more in the market, and we'll brief you on that a little bit. First of all, the new law um, has a very uh, high-level new goal of uh, achieving 80% of gross electricity consumption from renewables by 2030. Previously, that was uh, 65%, uh, so you can already see that the short-term ambition of the legislator here has increased significantly. And another very important element that is a little more um, abstract at first glance, but will have a, a significant impact on project development is that um, the um, uh, accelerated construction operation of renewable energy plants now is an overwhelming public interest and uh, generally serves public safety. That is something that has been encoded in the law and that will certainly help um, a lot with uh, ongoing permitting procedures and processes to get uh, projects really online. Um, as I said, the changes apply as of 1st January, and um, uh, the first tender is due to begin in the first quarter of 2023. And um, uh, there were already first amendments uh, that, uh, that already came into force in July on 2022, but we will not focus on those today, but on the changes mostly to the Wind Energy Act. And for that, I hand over to my colleague Marike. 
Thank you, Felix. Um, yeah, happy to be here. It's, my name is Marika. I'm a senior associate here at Chatham Partner and we'll give you a little bit of an overview of the changes to the wind Seegesetz, which is the main code for the offshore wind um, here in Germany. And following up on the increase um, target that Felix just mentioned, we also have a significant increase on the expansion target for offshore wind, which is now 70 gigawatt by 2045. And you can see it in, in, the, in the little table that we put up here that this is reaching also time-wise, but also from the amount quite quite a bit. So that's quite interesting. And more on a procedural level, we, um, we have some changes to the procedure, which is also aiming on fast in the procedures um, on the time perspective. We have now um, the duration of procedures in the law. Um, we will see if that is actually working because we have seen it in different laws as well, that this is then more of a paper war between the authorities and the project developer. But which is interesting is that the past plan permission procedure will apply for quite a few projects which will come now on, on the market, which is including the grid connections, which took a couple of years in the, in the past and um, everybody hopes that this will speed up this um, by quite a few years. And then we have the um, very interesting changes to the tender design and um, the structure of it. And I don't know if you have been involved in the previous um, discussion, there were quite a few um, draft, drafting rounds um, in the legislative process and we had um, contract for difference models were, which were implemented in the previous draft but all of a sudden when we had the um, ESA packages then signed and ready for execution um, there was no contract for difference anymore but we now have two different regimes which will apply and they um, differentiate between the non-investigated um, side and the pre-investigated side. And what it does is that for the bids for the pre-investigated side will now be ranked on points. And we will take a look at this a little bit later, what kind of points you will get for each criteria. And the old tender procedure, which is um, now applicable for the non-pre-investigated side, kind of remains the same. And here the lowest bid will receive the award. If we take a look at the new criteria for the evaluation of the bids for the pre-investigated side, we have now um, the criteria that you see on the slides, which are five criteria now, and the, the most important criteria is the bid amount. So bidders are invited to submit the bid amount, and then you will get um, 60 points if you have submitted the highest point. And then we have some more quality criteria, um, which is the decarbonization criteria, the PPAs, so the noise reduction installation um, technologies and impact on the seabed, and the numbers of Chinese employed in relation to the total number of employees. Um, it's quite interesting to take a closer look at all of those criteria. Um, for example, the PPAs, or more specifically, you have to submit LOIs at the very early stage when you submit your bid. So it's going to be interesting who in the market will be in a position to have those LOIs at hand. And um, if it is in more in favor of, um, let's say, more traditional utilities who can um, uh, can use their market um, impact and, and actually be in a position to put those LOIs um, in, in their board. Also, the number of trainees employ employed in relation to the total number of employees is an obvious also a little bit difficult if you take a look on this from a more um, institutional fund perspective, um, which is of course a little bit different than um, traditional utilities, which do have um, a lot of sisters and other companies which will be counted with this number. So, um, yeah, it's, it's still interesting to see if those qualities criteria, how they are applied and how the market will react to those um, criteria. Uh, this is quite new and it's the first time it's implemented in, in the regime that we have quality criteria. And for each of those criteria, you will re, um, receive your points and then the highest um, bid with the maximum points will receive the award. We have on the next slide, um, a little bit of the comparison or the contrasting of the two regimes that, which will be then in place um, starting next year where you can see the, the differences and um, you do have a little bit of a time difference between um, when those tenders will be announced and when the process deadlines will are implemented and as you can see we have also um, the different uh, plan permission um, regimes which I mentioned earlier and then um, you do have different um, different security amount that you have to submit at your bid. But I think we're not going to go into much detail on those more procedure rules and go a little bit further. Um, what which 
what would be the implications on other um, neighbor markets or other industries that come along with this um, expansion target? And obviously, one of the main um, hurdles or obstacles would be the um, expansion of the electricity grid. And already now, we are seeing um, some difficulties on the time, time timelines and on, on um, actually the dimensions that are needed. And especially when you have such an ambitious target as it is now implemented, this will be more stressed and um, we will be interesting to see how the how this will be addressed. And already now it has been said that the existing offshore corridors for grid condition will be soon be exhausted. So in our view, it will be necessary to implement new and creative solution to address this issue of grid bottlenecks that will be more um, interesting, especially when we have um, all those 70 gigawatt implemented and the wind is blowing. Felix will take over now and address this a little bit more in detail. Yeah, just a few brief points on that. I mean, we have also another slide here on the implications for other renewables, and um, it's noteworthy that there's also a uh, um, envisaged introduction of H210 volumes for 500 megawatt of green hydrogen um, uh, to be produced with electrolyzers between 2023 and 2028, which feels very little um, uh, considering uh, the build-out targets uh, overall and um, uh, further regulation is coming. But I want to um, uh, just uh, go into a few points that Marike just uh, mentioned. And the one is um, uh, this transmission challenge. I mean, the goal to have 70 gigawatt by 2050 means, and everybody knows that, that um, the onshore grid will either have to be enhanced uh, to an to an a very, very large degree, um, and then uh, a lot of hydrogen integration would have to happen, storage hydrogen. And so the question really is, how can this work, and does it make sense to keep the German system that is in place right now to offer a megawatt of uh, offtake, uh, electricity offtake capacity for each megawatt of offshore wind production capacity being built? Um, we think that it would make more sense, and we know that there is a discussion going on about uh, potentially having some of that um, directly feed into electrolyzers that can be placed offshore rather than building all the expensive electrical infrastructure to transport electricity 120 kilometers to shore and then transform a lot of it into, electro, uh, into hydrogen there onshore um, because the grid onshore is not, um, uh, is not uh, uh, sufficient for that. The other thing that plays with that is that this whole idea about uh, creating an offshore grid and uh, connecting the neighboring European markets uh, will play a significant role with these build-out targets. It's not reflected in the regime yet, not really at least, um, uh, but there will be, um, uh, there will have to be further discussions, especially when we look into the four further north areas in Germany, the Dogger Bank, that are really bordering to other jurisdictions on three sides on how these will be coordinated, especially when it comes to interconnection of the, uh, of the electricity markets and, and offtake solutions. And just a last point, a bit more detailed on the, um, on the tender process, we find it very interesting to see that now the German legislator has taken the step to implement qualitative criteria. We feel that um, considering the build-out times that we're looking at here, 2029, 2030, with a lot of this offshore wind capacity, um, this is uh, this is a difficult path um, because a lot of those qualitative criteria essentially are addressing uh, the supply chain. And so, if you're looking at a tender process running in 2023 and 2024, the question is how do you actually uh, make sure that your supply chain, for example, when it comes to trainees, when it comes to decarbonization, all these efforts already can commit to that at the time that you tender, or how this will be implemented. And then um, uh, the same applies for the PPAs for offtake in 2029 and 2030. So, um, and if this is so difficult with such a long horizon uh, to really get binding commitments, the question is what is the value of these qualitative criteria and aren't they going to be um, sort of tokenism uh, to a certain degree at least at this stage of the development. But that's a point that maybe is a good one to end this and to uh, refer to the later discussion, and we'd be very much interested to hear your opinion on that. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Felix and Marika, for this very comprehensive overview of the German offshore wind market. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Timon Gombert. Uh, Timon? Yes, over hey, good you. afternoon. Good morning, good evening, depending on the where you are in the world. Um, thank you 
for giving me the opportunity to update you on the Dutch market and especially what's going on uh, because we live in exciting times also from a Dutch perspective. Um, at first, a quick introduction on Blix. Um, we are an independent consultancy here in the Netherlands and our claim to fame is to say that we are at the forefront of the energy transition, which means that we have been supporting from the early days of offshore wind and especially looking at the Dutch landscape there we have been uh, playing an instrumental role. So we support governments, TSOs, developers, and the rest of the supply chain. And looking at the Dutch offshore wind landscape, uh, we have been co-architect of the Dutch tender system, so advising the governments in 2010. Um, we have been responsible for the site selection and all the analysis, where to build offshore wind, um, and also, again, advise the government on that. So big parts of the roadmaps that you see currently being announced by our government are uh, indeed uh, drafted partly by us. Uh, we do advise on grid towards the 10 TSO, but also towards the government again. And we are responsible for the majority of site and soil investigations, creating state-of-the-art data packages, which really give a low-risk uh, opportunity for developers to uh, to plan their, uh, their bids and uh, to further develop these sites. Second to our work for the government, we work for developers during the tender phase. So these two things do not really conflict each other. And uh, last but not least, we have been significantly involved in Holland's Coast West tender. Uh, on both ecology and system integration. If you look at the Dutch landscape, what is interesting to know is that the landscape is shifting. Uh, we just heard that um, Germany is moving towards qualitative criteria. Um, you could almost say that the Dutch are moving away a little bit from that, and I'll explain in a bit more detail. So if you look at the past, and then I mean Borsele Wind Farm, Holland's Kust Zuid, um, Thanks to this structured roadmap we have by our government, uh, the rollout uh, allowed for the first subsidy-free offshore wind tenders, which was a great, uh, great success. I think everybody would agree with me. Uh, Holland's Coast North, which was after Holland's Coast South, uh, there, there was a first introduction of qualitative criteria on innovation, and I was mainly focusing offshore. So Holland's Coast North is currently being built. I think uh, yesterday or the day before, the first monopower went into the waters, and there they will use uh, intelligent wake steering small offshore hydrogen production, offshore solar, uh, all on a small scale, but to test these innovations if they could uh, um, complement to an offshore wind farm in general. Uh, I think majority of the people in this audience will be aware of the Holland's Coast West tender, which closed in May this year, and that was a real game changer. Uh, instead, the government trying to dictate what needs to be done, they said, well, Dear developers, come up with your best program on system in integration and ecology. Um, and the one with the best program the, wins the beauty contest and is allowed to develop these sites. So they really reach out towards developers to help solving them the challenges which we all have in offshore wind, especially the challenges which hamper ourselves into a large scale rollout. Uh, one wind farm is not really influencing uh, the ecology, but if you would build 20, 25%, 30% of the North Sea full with wind farms, yes, that's in, then indeed you get big large-scale effects on ecology, but also on grid integration on, on numerous things. So um, what we also saw in Holland's Coast West Tender is that um, at the last moment, more or less, a small financial bid was included, which was 50 million euros. Uh, everybody more or less uh, accepted that. Um, so everybody got the same points for that, and still it was only a beauty contest. Um, what you saw in the beauty contest in general, that uh, a lot of developers, if you looked at the press releases, they were willing to reinvest a big part of their MPV, maybe even go MPV, MPV negative on a bit, to really win this strategic project and showcase what they can be, what they can do on ecology and system integration. Um, I'm Ver, which is uh, the next tender won't be a copy of HKW. Uh, it will still be a lot of qualitative criteria, but we see that the market situation is changing. Uh, we know all know the, the effect on energy prices at the moment, and we see a debate within the Dutch government, um, which allows more or less for a larger financial bid. Uh, you can also imagine uh, having a 100% qualitative tender requires a lot of preparation, a lot of work uh, from our government, um, and there are voices within the government which say, well, we should go towards an auction regime instead of a beauty contest if we really want to roll out fast. Um, that's maybe partly valid. On the other hand, I think um, the Dutch 
supply chain and not only the supply chain but also a lot of developers said well please uh, let us do these qualitative tenders because it also allows us to further develop uh, towards future offshore wind farms um so the advice which the whole supply chain gave to us the government to not to go for pure auctions is heard by government and institutions and we're now awaiting their reply a bit more on the Holland's Coast West tender. Uh, so that closed in May. Uh, the winner is expected mid-November, although it can be again be delayed a little bit. Um, but in general, you could say that the setup of the beauty contest is proven to be a success. There was a, at first they were quite hesitant if if a lot of people would come to our market, but in the end, a lot of players uh, submitted their bids, and the feedback from the market is also positive. Um, although we see a lot of similar solutions being pledged. Uh, and some suggestions are already made to include these solutions in the next tenders. Um, and our, the government already gave a sneak peek. They were wanted to go further down in noise reduction during installation uh, with a limit at 160 dB and maybe even lower in future tenders. And one other thing from an ecology point of view is the increase of the minimum tip height, which has is been discussed currently uh, by those legislatures. Um, another feedback is it is a lot of work for developers uh, and also the supply chain and that might not be feasible for all tenders to come. Uh, the assessment process is currently uh, being done, which is very challenging. It's done by an expert committee. Uh, and of course, uh, you could uh, argue if a winner is announced, um, probably other bidders will argue if that is the correct winner and why did they win. And you can, you can imagine there will be a lot of discussions. So we have to see how that all plays out uh, and how it influences the next tender, which is a might of air. On Amida Fair, um, which is a four gigawatt development, uh, four chunks of one gigawatt, will be the first tender where Tenet will use their two gigawatt HVDC blocks, which is quite a novel technology. Uh, the tender rules are expected, or at least it is announced that they will be shared this month. Uh, and by the looks of it, it will be four themes, four qualitative themes. Again, system integration, uh, ecology slash sustainability slash nature inclusive design. There is a, a topic on circularity, uh, most likely, and there are, are discussions on societal, societal impact. So how would you, um, let's say, encourage the society of the Netherlands to, to be in, uh, in, in touch with offshore wind? How would you make sure that it's not a wind farm far offshore, but actually that the people of the Netherlands have benefit from that, not only from a power price perspective, but also from, uh, from labor, education, those sort of things. And you see, as I said, two forces here. The Economic Affairs Ministry really wants to have a qualitative bid. Uh, again, encouraging the development of offshore wind. Again, also on innovations and market engagement. While the Ministry of Finance wants to go for a more financial bid and also unlock the, well, I would say the current market positions uh, for such a low risk development, because still it is a ready to build uh, 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 wind farm that you, will, uh, that you will be awarded because we do all the pre-investigations um, uh, within the government. So the exact combination of qualitative and financial bid is currently unknown. Uh, I think everybody is awaiting this uh, <laughs> with great interest. Um, looking at the timeline itself, um, end of November, there will be a workshop by the government given with more, uh, more information, most likely. Uh, final tender rules are expected early 23, and bid submission will be in one, roughly one year from now. Uh, and COD actually will be in 28. After that, most interesting, uh, we of course continue. We all have our great pledges on uh, what we want to do in offshore wind. Every country tries to compete with the other. Um, the government urged that they say we continue this strategy. We will be in control. We'll do all the pre, uh, pre assessments, uh, the site investigations, and make sure there are low risk developments uh, for the bidders. Um, you see that uh, there is, has been an overview given by the government. It's shown on the right with all the upcoming wind farms. Um, and there are some interesting parts in there. Uh, for example, Holland's Coast West Extension, which is a roughly 700 megawatt wind farm uh, connected to the Holland's Coast uh, development, which has been auctioned, which will be awarded this autumn. Um, will be developed at a later stage, and currently there has been a mark uh, there by the government that they want to um, align that with the plans of Tata Steel, which is a big steel manufacturer at the Dutch coast. Um, most likely, that this will be one of the first H2 only um, uh, offshore wind uh, developments, uh, 
delivering H2 from an offshore location directly to a steel factory. Also, to north on the water, which has been postponed uh, until further notice, uh, might as well become an H2 wind farm, although this is not 100% sure yet. Looking at the potential after 2030, um, there's a big potential, of course, and also uh, big announcements. Uh, the next step will be uh, the unlocking of the zone above uh, Amai de Ver. So that's the five, six, seven zones that you see on the map on the right. Uh, there's roughly 30 gigawatts, maybe even more, of, uh, of offshore wind. And there the government is already looking into a combined grid and H2 pipelines uh, being auctioned in blocks of at least four gigawatts. What we do see with the government taking a lot of control here is that there is limited room for greenfield development. And there are North H2, H2 at sea, um, which are commercial developments trying to get into the market here. Uh, that will be difficult, uh, although the government is open to, uh, to discussions on that. So that's in short from my side. Thank you uh, for uh, allowing me to give this presentation. and would be very curious to hear also the other presentation and further discuss um, yeah, the Dutch landscape with you. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Tyman, for this very insightful presentation into the Dutch market, offshore wind market. And just a reminder for the questions, please use uh, the tab uh, on your control panel. There's a question tab. Just uh, type your question there and I will read it to our speakers uh, after the presentation. And now it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our final speaker for today, John Bigala. John, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your, uh, the opportunity to be able to uh, speak to the, the WFO folks. And um, I'm here to present just a, an overview of the US market and, and where things stand. Uh, before we get into it, though, um, just a brief uh, background on the business network for offshore wind for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, we're a 501c3 operating here in the United States for the past 10 years to develop the U.S. supply chain and ensure the development of offshore wind in the U.S. Uh, we have now uh, gotten over 550 members and we continue to grow and we are also the hosts of um, what hopefully a lot of your attendees are familiar with, uh, the IPF, the International Partnering Forum. Uh, which we hold every year in the spring and next spring will be up in Baltimore. So before we get into a, an overview of the market, I wanted to begin just by speaking very briefly about uh, some really exciting news that we have here in the U.S. market. Just broke yesterday. Uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the federal agency responsible for auctioning off uh, lease areas has announced the California auction for December the 6th. Uh, they have identified five lease areas over the past, um, three of which are off of Morro Bay, two of which are um, northern in, in Northern California off the coast of, of Humboldt Bay. Um, for those of you who have been following the U.S. market closely, uh, you'll notice that the lease areas uh, remain both the same in, in terms of size and orientation as the proposed lease areas. Uh, this is good news for the industry. There had, there's always concerns in the U.S. market of other ocean users uh, uh, restricting the, the size of lease areas. And so we were very happy to see that the final lease areas did come out um, as, as anticipated. Now, um, there were some notable revisions in the terms of the auction. Uh, so one of which being that this is going to be conducted as a single auction format. What this effectively means is that all five lease areas will be up for bid at the same time, rather than holding two simultaneous auctions. Uh, and of course, the difference being that if there were two simultaneous auctions, hypothetically, a single developer could uh, win a lease area in the northern uh, wind energy area and a lease area in the, the central coast uh, lease area by Morro Bay. Uh, this instead, this single auction format will ensure there'll be five different developers, uh, which will uh, presumably create some more competition, both in terms of supply chain development and power delivery to the grid. There's also a 30% bidding credit available uh, if the developers choose to pursue that. Uh, the U.S. market has been exploring bidding credits over the course of this year uh, as a, a means to reducing auction prices, but also to incentivize supply chain, workforce development, and other um, local benefit uh, projects uh, such as CBAs, which is a community benefits agreement. Uh, as you can see here, there's a 20% credit off of your bid if you commit 
uh, to the federal government that you will be uh, that you as the developer will be engaging in supply chain and workforce development projects uh, and investing that money in uh, into the local economy. There's also a 5% uh, credit for a general community benefits agreement and a 5% credit for a lease area specific uh, community benefits agreement, which would target presumably uh, other ocean users that are close to the lease areas. Finally, uh, the federal government removed a 25% 20, credit allocation requirement, uh, which had previously said that 25% uh, of your bidding credit of the money that you've received as a, a credit off of your bid um, would need to be allocated by the time of COP submission. Uh, the developers unanimously agreed that this was uh, unfortunately not a uh, reasonable requirement of the federal government and that the long course of development that's going to be required for the West Coast uh, did, was not well suited for this uh, requirement. Uh, before we move on very briefly, it's worth noting that this, these lease areas will all be floating lease areas. Uh, the depth of these range from about 500 meters up to 1,300 meters. Uh, so this is very deep water, um, and so the technological challenges are, are going to be significant. But uh, in speaking with folks from California government, uh, the state and both and, and federal partners are pursuing strategies to be able to uh, accomplish this, this challenging task. Moving on more broadly to the, the U.S. Uh, offshore wind market, uh, we have been calling here at the Business Network for an industrialization strategy for the past couple of years. Um, and 2022 has really brought about a coalescence of that industrialization strategy. This is happening both uh, from executive actions from the Biden administration in terms of setting a clear path for 30 gigawatts by 2030 and establishing regular uh, auctions and a predictable a uh, predictable leasing schedule, as well as coordinating across agencies in the federal government in order to expedite leasing. It's also been coming from support from Congress. The Infrastructure and Investment, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provided significant money uh, for port development and for transmission planning. Uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act uh, extended production and investment tax credits, uh, as well as in creating new manufacturing tax credits, some of which were specifically targeted offshore wind, including offshore wind vessels and, um, and uh, offshore wind components. So breaking down what, what this industrialization strategy looks like, um, this has been able to create, the tax credit has been able to create something that those credits span a pro this is also about to the middle of the 2020s. Um, the IRA also allowed uh, leasing in the uh, South Atlantic and U.S. territories, including Puerto Rico and Guam. Um, and it also uh, guaranteed, the, the U.S. has also seen um, the approval of two uh, commercial scale projects, uh, South Fork Wind and Vineyard Wind. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are also targeted investments included in the IRA the, for offshore wind specific manufacturing. There's a 10% vessel tax credit. There are tax credits both, both for nacelle production, tower production, blade production, and foundation production. Finally, there is going to be, be some significant work still required to be able to de fully develop the U.S. market, uh, and much of that will be happening between the state and federal governments uh, in a collaborative effort. Um, one of the, the real keys that we see in implementing a national industrialization strategy is going to be the establishment of regional collaboration. Um, to that end, the, the Biden administration announced a new federal state offshore wind implementation partnership. Um, this consists of four cabinet secretaries and 11 governors, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, all up and down the East Coast. Uh, the implementation partnership is going to focus on supply chain or, and workforce development, uh, as well as transmission and ocean co-use. Um, our CEO, Liz Burdock, attended the inaugural meeting of the implementation partnership earlier this year. Um, and we are pleased to announce that they continue to meet and move forward, and we're excited to see what uh, developments may come from this. So now all of this work from the federal government and the state governments has led to uh, an emergent U.S. supply chain. Uh, this, uh, this graphic here shows the um, companies that have registered with our Supply Chain Connect database in the United States as either being capable of or interested in doing work in the offshore wind industry. And as you can see, it spans nearly all 50 states and is not just co concentrated along the coasts. Uh, this is an encouraging development because the further that the offshore wind supply chain stretches into the heartland of the U.S., the more that we expect that the industry is going to be able to uh, withstand any shifts in political um, control of Congress, whether it may flip to the Republicans or re retain uh, and remain in Democratic hands. Uh, just very quickly here is, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, just a, an overview of the existing East Coast market. 
Uh, as you can see, there are 27 projects in various stages of development up and down the East Coast. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is looking at expanding leasing into California, conducting an auction on December 6th of this year. Um, and I'll be speaking about this later, but the Gulf of Mexico is the, really the next big uh, market when we're looking ahead to next year. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of this development has been driven by state commitments to, to offshore wind. Um, as you can see, over, over the course of the last four years in, in particular, there have been massive increases in state procurement targets. Uh, but these procurements are just really the, these procurement targets are just the beginning. Um, uh, we conducted an analysis earlier this year of state planning uh, task forces and other um, statements from state governments, um, and we can reasonably see a path to a 110 gigawatt market here in the United States. Uh, a lot of this is reliant on the West Coast engaging in, in the offshore wind market. Um, and earlier this year, a Cali California AB 525 task force set a goal of 25 gigawatts by 2045 uh, for the state uh, in terms of transmission planning. Um, so we feel that these, these projections are, are fairly strong um, and uh, will be met in the coming years. Now, in order to track all this uh, activity, we've decided to introduce a quarterly market report in addition to our annual market report. Um, there's so much happening in the East Coast, in the U.S. market right now, we felt like this was a, a necessary step to be able to keep all of our members um, informed of what was going on. Um, the, the focus of, of this report uh, really looks at the solicitations that came out uh, earlier this year, uh, as well as some of the planning goal that came from California, as well as um, some shipbuilding and port development announcements that came earlier this year. Uh, there were six CTVs announced uh, to be built by St. John's Shipbuilding in Florida. Uh, there were also two major, uh, there was a major investment in the Portsmouth uh, Marine Terminal down in Virginia for Skanska to do the um, uh, reinforcement uh, work down uh, in the staging area that Siemens Gamesa, Dominion, and Ersted have secured leases on. Uh, finally, as I said earlier, uh, the Gulf of Mexico is shaping up to become a, a very exciting new market in the U.S. Uh, for those of you who may be familiar, the Gulf of Mexico has a long history of uh, offshore oil and gas development, uh, and as a result has really strong port infrastructure, a strong workforce, uh, excellent supply chain, uh, and has already been servicing the East Coast market. Um, I, we believe that as the, the Gulf Coast begins to develop, there will be significant uh, supply chain in place to be able to develop these projects at a reasonable cost, um, and there's a strong en wind energy resource as you move down the Texas coast. Um, one of the, uh, th these these draft wind energy areas, I, I should clarify, are still in the draft form. BOEM uh, has not officially released them as wind energy areas yet, um, although we anticipate that due to their very thorough deconfliction process, there will be very few ocean users that uh, take issue with uh, potentially citing leases in these, uh, in these two areas here. Um, as a part of that deconfliction process, BOEM had a look at the entire central and western Gulf of Mexico um, and used a, um, a, a spatial modeling tool to be able to identify areas that may potentially uh, serve as future wind energy areas for the offshore wind industry. Now, I should clarify, these are not wind energy areas that BOEM has put up for auction. There is no tangible action that's happening on them yet. Um, and the, the model, the spatial modeling that they use may change in the future, um, thus resulting in a change in wind energy area options. However, what this demonstrates is the possibility that the Gulf of Mexico could become a major site of development for offshore wind. Um, one of the keys to development in the Gulf, though, will be establishing clear paths uh, for offtake. Um, neither Texas nor Louisiana has established a mechanism for purchasing the power from offshore wind, um, so it may come down to commercial PPAs or some form of green hydrogen production uh, in order to secure offtake for the, the Gulf Coast market. Um, Looking ahead, uh, the Business Network hosts a number of events. As I mentioned earlier, IPF will be coming up in the end of March, but uh, uh, coming up sooner, we've got a Grid and Transmission Summit in Charleston. We're doing our awards gala in DC. We have a supplier day in California that we just announced um, in conjunction with the auction. Um, and of course, we have an O&M and Health and Safety Summit in, in New Orleans. Um, we certainly hope to see you all at IPF in 2023. 20, uh, uh, this is uh, the biggest gathering of offshore wind uh, in the United States. We regularly bring in 3,000 plus attendees, uh, and this is a can't miss event.
If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. If you'd like to see our market report, I'd be happy to, to speak with you about that and share it. Um, here's my contact information here, or you can get in touch with Ilya and the folks at WFO, and I'd be happy to, to speak with you. I really appreciate the opportunity to present today and look forward to the discussion. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, John, for this excellent presentation and a great, a great overview of the United States market um, development update. So we have approximately 15 to 20 minutes for a Q&A session. That's great. We already have a few questions. And for those who would like to ask additional questions, please use your, use your control panel uh, on the right-hand side. There's a question tab. Just type your question there. So maybe we start with the first uh, general question. Um, uh, what are the current and most pressing challenges and risks in the offshore wind industry development in the respected countries we discussed today? And you can go a bit deeper into detail or just uh, name a couple of them, which you believe are the most pressing challenges or risks or both. So maybe we'll start with uh, the team Felix and Marika then Timon and then John. Um, happy, happy to do so. I mean, it's a very, it's a very broad, broad question. Uh, so, uh, so trying to give a broad answer. I mean, I think um, in Germany, it's generally, I think it's the volume. Um, if you look at all these plans, um, uh, both in the European waters, but also in the in the US, I think to uh, to get the supply chain. Uh, to, to really build all these um, uh, these facilities is certainly something that I think um, it is a significant um, general risk to the industry or a challenge for the industry, um, but also an exciting one, I guess. Um, in Germany, I would say it is really um, finding a coherent system that is integrated with Europe and that now translates into the optimized use of the resource poured into the um, uh, into the EEZ uh, uh, in Germany and in, in, in the North Sea generally in the Baltic Sea for a, uh, for a, a reasonable system integration as well and I think this is really if you look at where we've been so far really tackling the technical challenges of bringing offshore wind farms online now we're really there to say we have to tackle the systems question with the numbers that uh, are coming uh, are coming now, and that is a uh, that is a different, a new kind of challenge, and it requires the next degree of industrialization uh, from our perspective. But that would be our perspective on it, next to some very national aspects um, uh, that concern the tender regime. Okay, thank you very much. I think from my side, uh, from the, the, the Dutch side, but also in the, in the works that we do internationally, I see a few things. I fully agree here with Felix as well. Uh, to add to that, I think in general ecology and also nature in wind farms and especially the cumulative effects that we will run into when we start developing offshore wind to a much bigger scale are certain things which are not solved yet. And actually, we do not know what will happen. So we should use the coming 10 years very wisely to start understanding and also mitigating these effects because uh, otherwise uh, maybe the yeah the solution that we have which we think is eco-friendly with green energy becomes a big issue in 20 years from now so that's one the other is i think the profitability in the supply chain uh, we see that governments um, with euro or dollar signs in their eyes think they can get a lot out of offshore wind trying to auction for hundreds of millions of euros any kind of sites resulting in developers actually paying that but in the end somebody has to pay that money so, or it's the one who pays the electricity bill, but I think most important, it is the supply chain, it's the contractors which are have very difficult times still to make any profit in offshore wind. If you look at Schemas Gamedes and Vestas, but also I think the general contractors doing EPC works, they could really use um, a bit of money to actually be able to develop uh, new technologies that will allow us to for a bigger outroll. So that's the two things from my side. Okay, thank you, Timon. Uh, John? Well, I, I certainly appreciate those perspectives. And, and here in the U.S., I think that the challenge is uh, very similar, but slightly different. Uh, and when I'm looking at the U.S. market, it's the challenge of inflation and rising costs uh, paired with supply chain disruptions. Um, you know, the U.S. has long enjoyed low electricity prices and consumers are, are not willing to pay significantly higher prices, especially at a time when uh, consumers across the board are facing inflation. Um, now, I think it's really important in the U.S. that we look at the overall value of offshore wind. 
there have been some really interesting studies percolating, uh, and none of which I think are actually published yet, but I've been uh, speaking with some, some outlets that are, that are conducting this research, looking at the long-term value of offshore wind that are finding that, that when you look at the lifespan of the project, uh, these, these do in fact reduce costs to consumers, both from a direct ratepayer benefit, but also from uh, overall benefits to the health and environment and reduction in carbon emissions, SOX and NOx. So I think that you know, being able to communicate clearly to the public uh, the overall value of offshore wind uh, and, and why these projects are important is, is going to be key in order to develop the U.S. market, uh, and in, especially in light of an inflation and, and supply chain disruptions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So that may be the question to build up um, on that. It's regarding the um, current energy crisis and what do you think offshore wind uh, can play in this, um, I would say, maybe in the midterm and long term. And since uh, for the short term, it's not really possible to change much, but what's your view in the longer perspective? And I think especially that could be a question to our European speakers for today. So maybe uh, for this one, uh, we go uh, Taiwan first, uh, then um, John, and then uh, Felix and Marika. I think if you currently see at the, the current merit order uh, how the power prices are built up, you see that offshore wind is already playing a big, big chunk of almost, I would say, especially nowadays, free electricity. Uh, but in the end, it's the, the limited amount of coal uh, and also gas, uh, predominantly, that we need to uh, to finally meet the, 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 the consumption requirements here. So uh, the bigger amount of offshore wind we can have, the the lower the prices will be of course we need to make sure that we can also use this power source when the wind is not blowing um, so yeah, i think in general it will be the coming two three years it will be a tough time also looking from inflation perspective and all kinds of commitments in the supply chain but after that the moment we get really into uh end of this decade uh we will see that um yeah we get more independent which is i think is a very good thing yeah, certainly. The U.S. doesn't really have the same sort of direct uh, impact of the energy crisis as our colleagues in Europe certainly are facing. Uh, however, you know, the, the U.S. It was, it was big news all over the country. Uh, faced very Consumers faced very, very high uh, gas prices for, for their vehicles earlier this year. Um, and as gasoline prices boom, uh, we've also seen a, a major shift to electric vehicles. Uh, and then building on that, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, the major piece of legislation passed earlier this year, includes a $7,500 tax credit for elect electric vehicles. So I think what that's going to lead to, obviously, is, is increased demand. Um, and so offshore wind is going to play a key role in being able to provide a steady supply of power, um, in addition to onshore and, so and solar, which are uh, very well developed here in the U.S. and continue to expand. Uh, but they're going to need the, the buffering effect of, of the more steady supply of power from offshore wind. Okay, thank you, Felix and Marika. Yeah, I mean, all, all of that uh, fully agree. Um, maybe to, to add also from a German perspective, um, with a lot of industry, but very densely populated country, it's uh, simply the, the best we have. Um, uh, there are uh, we have the acceptance issues in the permitting for onshore wind, increasingly also for um, a large scale, industrial scale solar. Uh, there is still potential uh, there, and I'm, I'm also a big fan where it works of de de uh, decentralized solutions. But uh, um, if you look at the power hunger of the German industry, it has to come from somewhere. And certainly there are thoughts about importing H2 in different derivatives. Um, and that is a, something to, to look in and to pursue, but it's certainly not something that in the midterm will, uh, will solve these issues for, for Germany. So um, if we want to have a, um, a hub to produce loads of uh, uh, green electricity um, uh, and do that in a, in a very efficient way, then offshore wind is the only one that we have. Yeah, and maybe just to add to what uh, Tillman also said in the very end, I think if we use the full potential that we have, even if, um, if we go beyond the EZ, um, the 300 MC miles, and it's it's a potential that will give us the independency that we that we need from the gas sector. And so, if we make use of all of the potential, um, this is a key role that offshore wind can play, especially in the northern countries of, of Europe. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And then to build up, the next question is from the audience regarding that uh, the port infrastructure, and that's uh, for the US. But maybe we can extend that question. Uh, to uh, our European colleagues as well. 
So how is the port infrastructure coping with the offshore wind development in the US and then in this case uh, in Germany and the Netherlands? Maybe we'll start with you, John, and then Felix and Marika and then Timon. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. The, the port infrastructure challenge is going to be significant for the US market. Uh, it, we, are, we are obviously decades behind European counterparts in terms of developing offshore wind specific port infrastructure. Uh, there will need to be uh, the sorts of investments that we saw uh, in the Portsmouth Marine Terminal in Virginia uh, to be able to increase the load bearing capacity of these facilities. Uh, it's going to require uh, creative solutions. Uh, we see that the, the three partners that are, that are gonna have to work together on this is gonna be federal, state, and private. Uh, I think from in, with investment from those three, as well as um, expedited permitting from the federal government and the, the relevant state governments, you may be able to see the U.S. Um, rise to the challenge in a, in a more uh, uh, expedient manner than you perhaps would have expected. Um, and you know, we're also seeing California begin to rise to the challenge of, of being able to develop their port infrastructure to support these floating uh, installations. Uh, there, there are currently a number of, of port. Uh, studies that are all going on at the same time right now, uh, which we expect to see maybe at the end of this year or early next year. Uh, and I think that that'll, that'll tell us a lot about how California is going to be able to develop their port infrastructure and, and what, what'll, what it'll look like. Great, thank you, John. Yeah, I, I think it was us next. I mean, I think I think this is, as, as we pointed out in Europe, I think the, the ports for what is happening right now are, are more or less there, right? So, I mean, the, the initial step has been done. And I think uh, just one brief one is that I think this is one of the great potentials for local value creation also, uh, where you can really convince people because the port uh, the port industry has been suffering. Um, so so to, to show people that there are jobs coming from this and uh, those are local jobs and is something that, uh, that really is a plus, and I think in, in a lot of northern regions here in Germany, um, really convinces people that this is a, a good way forward, and that the uh, always uh, mentioned 20,000 jobs in coal are not uh, what we need to uh, be most concerned about, but that there are a lot of value drivers for local economies. Okay. And maybe to add from that from a Dutch perspective, eh, of course we have very well equipped ports for offshore wind, uh, Rotterdam, Zeeland, and also Amsterdam. Uh, we do see that actually the Amsterdam Harbour is now starting to build a marshalling hub also to serve as the upcoming wind farms uh, nearby. Uh, what we do see, which is also port infrastructure, is uh, the need for hydrogen in ports. Most of the time ports are combined with an industrial cluster. Uh, and we do see that from a space perspective, there is a, a very limited space to do onshore electrolysis, um, and which more or less pushes, pushes the need towards an offshore electrolysis uh, process instead of doing that onshore, which of course comes with new challenges as well. Well, great, okay, great. Um, the next question is regarding floating offshore wind. So maybe if we can briefly discuss that question, um, what are the perspectives uh, and the current status of floating offshore wind in uh, respective countries? Maybe we'll start this time with Timon, then John, and then Felix and Marika. Uh, that's quite simple for the Netherlands. We all have perfect sandy soils. So uh, floating offshore wind, uh, if you try to apply for a subsidy here to develop something on offshore floating, the government will say, oh, it's not here in the Netherlands needed. So uh, <laughs> so no, for the Netherlands, there's no, uh, not that much to do. Although, of course, internationally, we have a huge amount of contractors who are active in floating offshore wind as well. That's great. Well, I guess for John is a different answer. <laughs> it's definitely a different answer. In the U.S., uh, NREL projects that about two thirds of our offshore wind potential is going to be floating. Uh, already, Boehm, like I said, is going to auction off the California lease areas, which will be floating. Uh, there will probably be lease areas off the coast of Oregon, which will also be floating. Uh, if Boehm does choose to develop uh, off of the coast of Maine, that will ne uh, necessitate floating designs. And then there are also some proposed uh, call areas in the central Atlantic. Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, and New Jersey, which are all in very, very deep water off the continental shelf. Um, so the, the U.S. is certainly going to participate in the floating market. There are a couple of demonstration projects in the pre-development phase here in the U.S. Um, I think the challenge is going to be uh, figuring out floating in these, these extra deep waters, so 500 to 1,300 meters, whereas most floating demonstrations are in the order of 180 to 200 meter uh, water. Uh, that, that's going to be challenging. However, if the, if the U.S. can figure that out, that will be, become technology that we can hopefully export and, and support other countries in their de deployment of deep water floating. 
Great, thank you. I mean, for us, the answer will probably be the same as uh, as, as Tamil's. I mean, we um, uh, with uh, also the challenges or largely resolved uh, in the last project, Arcadis Oster Park did, did a marvelous job on even using the most complex soil conditions as long as the water depth is uh, relatively low. I think that has uh, really um, cut it for Germany. But I, I do think that maybe potentially, if you look at it from a German-European perspective, um, and we and Marike mentioned that only on the side right now, there is still the high seas. And um, and I think that is something that um, uh, that is obviously very complex from an international law perspective to think, okay, how can we unlock that potential? But I think for Europe, the big question will be um, in the long run, are we going to use and how much are we going to use of these um, very preferred um, production uh, locations in the southern hemisphere for hydrogen? Or are we going to find another solution for that? And from our perspective, having looked at this, and you can check it out on our website, we've done a paper on that, um, the high seas, um, if uh, tackled in the right way, could offer something for that. It obviously needs uh, uh, the consent of a larger, uh, of, the, of the wider uh, global community that we decide that we want to unlock um, uh, this potential. But if you look at Europe and also at what Time mentioned early, earlier, um, um, ecological concerns, especially in the North Sea, which is one of the most dense uh, uh, seas that we have, like in the uh, land mass around it, and obviously then coming with it a lot of biodiversity and all the things that come in, in, in these diverse, uh, diversely structured places. Uh, the, the high seas is much less sensitive, and, um, and, and so I think even for Germany, it would make sense to think about, um, uh, um, uh, to think about this in general on a more European level, um, uh, and, um, and that could be one of the things that uh, could also make this discussion more relevant in the German context, um, if ever unlocked. Great, thank you very much for sharing your views. And now we are we only have time for last one question, and let's that question to be more like a forecast, like a different hat. Uh, so based on your experience, what do you foresee coming in the next year or so? Uh, so like like short midterm like very actually rather short term uh, yeah and um, pretty much anything you would like to share at that moment regarding the your feeling uh, for the offshore wind developments in your respective country or if you would like to maybe add a bit more a global perspective um, so yeah maybe we go with uh, John first from the U.S. perspective then Timon and then Felix and Marika. Well, I think in the next year, uh, we're excited to see the development of the first commercial scale floating, or, I'm sorry, sorry, the first commercial scale uh, projects here in the U.S. Uh, with, with Vineyard and, and uh, South Parkwin, hopefully moving forward with offshore construction activities as soon as, soon as possible. Uh, and then we also are excited to see leasing activity occurring uh, in California and the Gulf of Mexico. As I said earlier, those are going to be the, the new, new big uh, markets in the U.S. And so we're excited to see Boeing conduct those auctions and developers secure the lease areas. Great. Okay, what's well, next? Okay, so uh, so I think uh, for us it's going to be an exciting one, right? We have uh, the first tender under the new regime, large capacities after a longer period where that wasn't the case and where there were only those rides with the step-in rides. Um, um, that that was certainly a very exciting, um, uh, or that will certainly be very exciting. Uh, then we have the first hydrogen offshore to hydrogen tender coming up. Um, that's also going to be something very interested. It's a smaller problem pro project, but uh, or a smaller tender. But it's also going to be very interesting to see how and who um, uh, will uh, will throw their head in the ring for that. And um, and I think there's going to be a lot of uh, further activity and, and integration. I hope um, uh, with the with the neighboring markets and and um, on the transmission side. Plus, we will see further projects coming into construction, which is also a great thing. After uh, this year, it's only been Arcadis Ost one basically that has been in construction in Germany. So, um, uh, so it's going to be a very exciting year, and um, we look forward to it. Great, and Taiman. Yeah, and last for me, uh, I think it's an exciting month to come, and also after that, the year. Main reason for that is that we see policymakers worldwide try to include qualitative criteria like production of H2 or ecology in their bids or in their policies. And what I do expect actually is that or what I hope that the supply chain and the developers bidding on Elon Coast West and also I might have there will show actually that they are further ahead of that, that they, it could well be that we now write policies for five years from now, 
but already we will see in next month that the pledges made by developers are already exceeding that and therefore even speeding up more in the path in the direction that we want that we have to go to make this a success great that was uh last uh last question um for today and thank you very much for sharing your views and for this very interesting discussion that we had in the last uh, 20 minutes that already brings us to the end of this webinar but the next one will come uh, in december so please join us um for the webinar on december 7th and it will be a reflection on this year 2022 and the way forward so we're going to build up on the last question that um, we just uh, discussed thank you very much for your time today john felix marika timen i really appreciate your time your um, very insightful presentation in the, in the your local markets and see you next time and have a great rest of the day everyone thank you you're welcome thank, thank you very much. thank you